Dr. Firoza J. Godrich, the chairperson of the Museum Society of Mumbai, to introduce the speaker and the talk for the day. Good evening, everyone. I am so delighted that so many of you could join us today for this event. On behalf of the CSMVS, the chairperson, Mr. Sh Shir Sagar, and the trustees of the CSMVS, on behalf of our Director General, Mr. Sabia Sachi Mukherjee, who I'm sorry cannot join us this evening, but Chiradeep, he sent you and the archives and all of us who are participating today his very warm wishes and is hoping that we will have a good lecture and a good deliberation to follow. I welcome the Godridge Archive team and the Chief Archivist, Rinda Patare, who has joined us from Vikroli. There are many people who've joined us, I believe, from several parts of India, at least. I don't know if they're from abroad, uh, maybe from Canada, Dr. Harsha and Mrs. Deheja. Welcome. Thank you so much. I have a small housekeeping announcement to make, so please bear with me for a few minutes. Next Saturday, on the, sorry, next Thursday, on the 1st of October, we have a lecture by Dr. Zera Jumabhoy, who will be in conversation with Mr. Girish Shahani. And it is the first of a talk series titled Past, Presence, Art and Heritage. The topic is Brown Britain, Indian Art, Imperial Encounters and Diasporic Dreaming, Thursday 1st, October at 5.30 p.m. We have two interesting events, uh, which are not museum related in the sense they are not lectures. But as many of you who are our Museum Society members know, we do a lot of outreach programs. And on Saturday, the 3rd of October and Tuesday, the 6th of October, we are having an event with some NGOs. These programs are conducted by our stalwart member, Mrs. Nat Marina Datta, who has been doing programs like this on behalf of the Museum Society for decades. And we are very happy that she'll be giving two programs to us. <coughs> the first one on Saturday, on sorry, on, uh, I beg your pardon, I've lost it. On Saturday the 3rd at 3 p.m., it's for one hour for 4 p.m., we're delighted that our member, Mrs. Arti Vakil, who runs a program called Wishing Well, along with her son, Arshan Vakil, who has given us the platform. His platform is an app called NGuru. And we will be talking to children about uh, a very, very interesting topic. It's the same topic for both days, being the joy of giving week and being 2nd of October, Gandhi Jayanti, Marina has decided to talk about the Gandhi March, which Jan Gandhiji flagged off on the 12th of March, 1930, as he set off from his ash ashram at Sabarmati near Ahmedabad with several dozens of his followers on a long walk of some 240 miles to the coastal town of Dandi. Marina will be enacting this with salt, with bottles filled with salt water, and it's going to be a very good program for children who are participating from a wishing well. And this another group of children from Catalysts for Social Action will be joining us for a program of their own on Tuesday, the 6th of October, 4 to 5. These children are from Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Goa, and Orissa. And we are delighted that they have chosen to partner with the Museum Society of Bombay in the joy of giving week. So with these few announcements for our future outcoming pro out, uh, outreach programs and our program for Thursday, the 1st of October, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Vrinda Pathare, Chief Archivist to our event today. We do a lot of an annual program with Godridge Archives at the museum and this is yet another one that we, will, we have added today. Typewriter tip tip. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you Chirudeep for being part of this very important event. Thank you. Chirudeep Chowdhury is the author of a critically fetid book, 
a village in Bengal, photographs and an essay, a result of his 13 year long engagement with his ancestral village in West Bengal and his family's nearly two century old tradition of celebrating Durga Puja. Two centuries, ladies and gentlemen, you will agree, is a really, really long time. So <laughs> congratulations to you and your family and may you, you grow from strength <laughs> to strength in this celebration that takes place annually in your village, ancestral village. Chirudeep's work documents the urban landscape and he has often been referred to as the chronicler of Bombay. During his career, he has produced diverse documents of his home city in a range of projects like Seeing Time, the public clocks of Bombay. Chirudeep, I'm going to request you for that lecture. <laughs> Another one topic that he is interested in is, is the one rupee entrepreneur. Yet another, commuters in the city, a library amongst others. He lives in Bombay and divides his time between his assignments, projects, teaching commitments, and chasing subjects as diverse as manual typewriters, abandoned helmets, and airport smoking rooms. Uh, that's not a real favorite of mine because I've really looked at them askance and say, why are they doing this when they know it's bad for their health? <laughs> so without much ado, I don't wish to stand between the audience and you. So may I now hand you over to Vrinda Pathare, Chief Archivist at Godrej Archives. Thank you so much and really enjoy the in evening. The slides are really very, very good. Thank you very much, Jason. Back to you and the tech team. Rinda, ma'am, could you unmute yourself, please? Yes. Uh, can Audible. you hear me? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Dr. Firuza Godrej. We are, as always, happy to collaborate with the Museum Society and the CSMVS. And before I hand it over to Chirodeep, let me quickly inform you about Godrej Archive. <coughs> uh, conceived in 1997 and formally started in the year 2006, Godrej Archives is a corporate archive preserving the history of 123-year-old Godrej group of companies, its products, its plants and people, and making it available for research. Apart from preserving the collection for future, Godrej Archives also strives to communicate this history through exhibitions, installations, publications, etc. And uh, Godrej Archives has also instituted an annual lecture series, which uh, Dr. Godrej also mentioned, uh, to make people appreciate the value of archives and popularize the subject of business history. Since 2006, we have been collaborating with the Museum Society and the CSMVS in this endeavor, and we intend to plan this soon. Uh, but this lockdown has made us explore new possibilities uh, of engaging with our audience through online talks. And here is the first one in that series, and we are very excited. Uh, to have Chirodip with us, because typewriters have always held a special space among uh, Godrejites. And in the year 2009, when Godrej stopped manufacturing the manual typewriter, we set out to document not just this 50 year long journey of the first Indian typewriter made by Godrej, but also the social cultural history of a period from the perspective of the typewriter and its user. And uh, this uh, project actually. Uh, was uh, this book titled uh, With Great Truth and Regard, A Story of Typewriter in India, was then released in 2016 uh, and is also available on um, Amazon. Uh, and to tell, tell the story of a typewriter which is so rich and varied through this book, we set out to explore the world of typewriter along with Chirodi, uh, who over the period of five years or I think even more, uh, <laughs> extensively capturing the final traces of typewriters in India uh, through visuals and tales of the people whom machine has impacted economically and culturally, including dealers, typing schools, suppliers of the typewriter components, users, and so on. And uh, I should not now stand between you and these wonderful stories. So I would now hand over to Chirudi and request him to share these details of typewriter. Thank you. Over to you, Chirudi. Thank you, Runda. Uh, should I, Jason, should I start sharing the screen? Uh, yes, sir. you can uh, yeah? go ahead with okay. sharing the screen. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. One thing. I'm getting a little box at the bottom which says C waiting room. Uh, uh, ignore that. We are handling that. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah. yeah. Can it be deleted and knocked out? Yeah. Thanks.
thank you, uh, Vrunda. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Godrej, for uh, getting me uh, on board to speak to this audience uh, today uh, on behalf of uh, the Museum Society Bombay. And uh, thank you, Jason, and your technical team, which always gives me a lot of comfort to know that there are people like you around uh, who are there to hold hands, uh, you know, uh, anyway. Uh, so let me, let me start off, uh, you know, so in uh, October 2009, uh, the last typewriter rolled out of, of the Godrej and Boyce manufacturing plant at Shirwal near Pune. And uh, in many ways, the chapter kind of ended. I mean, you know, but I think I, I came to, I heard the news. I saw it, I think, as a tiny little news item somewhere. And I remember uh, calling up Brunda and, uh, you know, kind of saying, oh, do you think you could get me to the plant to kind of photograph the last day of the manufacturing? And, uh, you know, I mean, it, things didn't quite work out that day, but I think that was really the beginning of our association, uh, you know, and the beginning of, of this project. Uh, so, you know, we did eventually land up in Shirwal, which was probably about a year later. Uh, my worry at that point was, you know, <clears throat> would, would there be, you know, as, as the delay, uh, as we were trying, as we were wondering if a project might at all happen, we were, I was really getting anxious, wondering like, would there be much left, you know, by the time we actually embark on it. We eventually did land up in Shirwar. Uh, you know, I went there, uh, you know, like most photographers, uh, I, I went there with ideas of, you know, a, a, a sort of a desolate plant, I mean, with remnants of uh, manufacturing and things like that. But I mean, you know, I was really surprised to see, uh, you know, there was some, some that the space which was originally for the typewriters was being used uh, now for something, for manufacturing something else. I forget what, what it was, but, uh, you know, and uh, it, it, was, it was quite amazing to see a complete transformation. But in one corner, there stood a huge pile of cardboard boxes, I mean, you know, from the floor going up to the ceiling. And these were the last batch of, of typewriters that had been manufactured and hadn't yet been dispatched or sold. And uh, these were the Arabic machines, as you can see here in this image. Uh, and this, this was really our first baby step in the project. I mean, uh, in the meanwhile, you know, parallelly, the typewriter was you could see the typewriter had kind of become an object of curiosity. It had become, you know, an object that was now retro cool uh, from, from an object of, of daily use, an object of, uh, you know, of, of daily function, uh, much like, you know, the gramophone record that you see here, uh, you know, the object, I mean, it was really something that, you know, people, people weren't using much, I mean, at least people of my, of our generation or a younger generation had see, seemed to have moved away from, uh, you know, and then it was sort of had become something that you use to decorate. Like this particular instance here, this is uh, a restaurant uh, called Smokehouse Delhi at, at Bombay's Phoenix Mill. And this interior designed by a friend of mine called Ayaz Basrai. Uh, you can see how a typewriter has been used here. Uh, this is a similar, this is another uh, restaurant in the same chain, but in Delhi uh, at Khan Market, where again, you can see, you know, the Bakelite phone, uh, you know, and the typewriter, both have kind of, again, turned into objects of, of, uh, of curiosity here. Uh, so, like I said, I mean, you know, my, my worry was that by the time we start the project, would there be enough left? I mean, you know, and we kind of thought, I mean, would we be left with things like spotting typewriters on objects like, you know, a, a, a matchbox and things like that. Uh, but I mean, the interesting thing is this is India, you know, and uh, technology doesn't, doesn't necessarily die a quick and violent uh, death. I mean, you know, it, it kind of, life kind of lingers on. I mean, there's, you know, uh, it, it kind of is stays on life support for, for, for a while. And then eventually at some point, 
I'm sure it might peter off. Uh, so, uh, so, so uh, as so seeing the way you know today, it's it's rare that you will you know find uh, an office where there's a typewriter, and it's still rarer to find an office which has a typist who has enough work. Uh, the typewriter though kind of survives uh, on the streets of India. Old and battered machines still being used by a small army of job typists who come each day and wait for customers, uh, fighting redundancy. Uh, they sit outside courts and on footpaths, uh, typing out affidavits, uh, birth certificates, and a variety of other legal documents. Uh, they sit perched on stools, sitting in wayside booths. The job typists have become part of the sociability of the streets that grew up around pavement vendors and, and the machines. Uh, as the typists, client, and friends sit around waiting for the documents to be typed, or simply to smoke, gossip, and drink tea. Uh, now, this actually became, you know, these scenes actually became our, in many ways, a sort of an entry point uh, for me uh, when it when it came to documenting. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, during the intervening period, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, when I uh, was was sort of spamming Vrunda with emails, you know, with lots of ideas about, oh, we could do this, we could do that. You know, uh, I, I think I was uh, I, I was kind of uh, you know dealing with a lot of excitement uh, with with typewriters and the idea, and I think one of the things uh, you know which which I knew would would exist as as photographic subjects would be these uh, typists, and I think it began with me doing a few pictures in Bombay, and I was traveling to Calcutta. Uh, Anyway, this was actually the first, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, the first trip that we made, this was to Delhi and largely to photograph uh, around the courts there. This was at the C. Cesare court. Uh, I, I, this, this also is, happens to be one of, uh, you know, my very favorite photographs. I mean, I think it really kind of shows in many ways, uh, you know, what I believe the typewriter kind of has become a symbol of, I mean, you know, it, it really is in many ways a symbol of, you know, uh, a bureaucracy. I mean, you know, if you look at, uh, if you look at the two ladies there, I mean, you know, they're kind of, uh, you know, from their body language, it's a kind of, you know, they've given a, this sort of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you know, waiting for things to happen, uh, you know, while the, 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 the typist who's a sort of an intermediary between, between them and you know the the great beast that is uh, the Indian bureaucracy. Uh, they're really at the mercy of the typewriter in many ways. You know, uh, I remember we kind of uh, hanging around the Cesare court, and I kind of returned after almost half an hour, forty minutes, and these two ladies were still there. Their job hadn't been done. Uh, you know. <clears throat> That's that's in Calcutta, and it's it's an interesting. Uh, I find this interesting. This photograph primarily because it reminds me always of you know a a, a, a joke, a Reader's Digest joke, uh, which kind of uh, spoke about uh, a signboard which said uh, you know Xerox done in all languages, because which is which really is a spin-off from you know typing done in all languages. I mean, and we did find typing. Uh, you know, typists working in different languages around the city, uh, around the country. I mean, as we travel, this is in this is in Calcutta, outside the Calcutta High Court. Uh, that's at the Bankshell Court. And again, I mean, you know, if you look at the the, the typist, I always liked their their attitude. I mean, you know, very often here he is kind of admonishing uh, the client. I mean, you know, who had actually misspelled something. And very often, I remember. Uh, in my conversations with these typists, they would very often tell me about how, you know, not not many of the clients kind of knew knew anything about English and how they had to kind of help them, you know, uh, get by with the language and things like that. I mean, I think they 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 thought of it as a as a as a, as a phenomenal skill uh, that that they kind of had. Uh, that's that's in Bangalore again. A very curious uh, sort of uh, thing. I mean, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that when we started the project, I started to spread the world, uh, the word, the word around uh, amongst my network of of uh, of friends and you know people who would often help me with information. 
uh, asking them about you know typewriter related things in their own cities and uh, people would sometimes revert with information sometimes they would send me uh, interesting uh, you know bits of information about things that they have they have sort of spotted uh, they would send me reference photographs and all that would happen the funny thing was in bangalore i mean you know these these ex colleagues of mine they were they kind of vehemently kept saying i mean chirudeep are you kidding i mean this is this is it city where do you think you're going to find typewriters they've all they've all been pushed aside thanks to thanks to computers and things like that eventually we landed up in bangalore and uh, this was around the city civil court and you see what was this huge uh, like a typist typist pool and uh, there were at least about 100 150 typists to sit there and work and my colleague uh, you know who had actually dismissed the thought that there might be typists in bangalore still was like completely aghast to kind of realize that he knew so little about his own city and i think this is also the interesting thing that i mean you know how there are these multiple uh, ways in which kind of india coexists uh, and then we we very often do not know of uh, of of various other layers uh, you know uh, in 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 the story that we are kind of working on because we are often so caught up in a certain narrative that our own cities uh, make up that's in uh, that's that's in uh, in allahabad uh, again i mean you know this whole thing about the typist and there was a certain kind of i think <clears throat> you know the always when i thought about the type the typing as an activity and stuff it it didn't it always uh, in my mind and it, it it could be one one could kind of debate it but i think i always envisioned scenes of this kind which were which which were kind of slow which had a certain kind of uh, you know uh, not a very fast pace a sort of uh, lethargy if i may call it uh, and i think i mean these were things that i was on the lookout uh, in terms of mood uh, you know when when i was moving around these areas and uh, of course i mean sometimes one got lucky you know uh, like you can see here you know people just waiting uh, that's again in delhi uh, sorry that's again in delhi at outside the sub registrar's office there's again a whole street filled with typists uh, you know and it it, it it makes quite a racket if you're going to walking down the street it's 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 quite an amazing soundscape as well uh, that's in srinagar uh at the, at the dis district and sessions court it wasn't one of the easiest shoots because i think being srinagar i think it required a lot of permissions and things like that to be in, and it had to be taken then and there uh, so we could work but again a very atmospheric sort of place uh, so um, i'm going to but you know one of the most fascinating uh, sets of typist that i came across is this next set of photographs that i'm going to show you it was probably the most unique uh, experience of of seeing job typists at work i mean this is in in uh, in ahmedabad uh, you know uh, around what in what is the the city and sessions court uh, so uh, so there there's a fort there called the bhadra fort and this this whole thing kind of uh, this whole scene uh you will see around the bhadra court uh essentially through the day i mean you know it starts at about 11 in the morning uh or a little earlier actually we landed up at about 11 it all it was already in full full swing what what is curious is that here you don't see the typists sitting sitting at tables and and desks and stools but they're all usually kind of sitting on the floor and working okay uh and i remember kind of uh, speaking to some of the a kind of nice chatty bunch of people uh, much chattier than uh, you know some of the other typists uh, who who would largely be be you know in a mood to crib uh, what i found was these these guys were more chatty uh, you know uh, more, a more fun bunch than a more cribby bunch uh, if if that's a word uh so uh, you know i would often i kept asking a lot of them that 
you know uh, why 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 do they kind of sit on the floor and and why why have they chosen to sit on the floor and not use tables and chairs and stools and one of them kind of pointed out to a shed in in the distance uh, you know which was uh, <clears throat> which which under which sat a whole army of of lawyers uh, and they said you know that shed was originally had originally been allocated for us uh but i mean i think before we could uh go in and and set up our workplaces the lawyers kind of uh landed up over there and as you know the lawyers you know he told me like with literally with with a shrug he said as you know the lawyers are uh, are more powerful than us i mean they're the kind of they have a more powerful lobby so they kind of effectively pushed us out so since then you know we have been sitting out here and anyway we we chose not to fight because we need each other you know the lawyers need us and we need them so we thought i mean it's it's nice let let us just you know live and let live sort of an attitude so we have continued to sit on the floor uh, nobody really remembered for how long they've been sitting sitting on on the floor and working but uh, you know pe- people kind of uh, had different kinds of dates uh that people said i mean so as you can see there are kind of people who type only in english there are guys who do english in gujarati there are guys who do only gujarati typing so that's that's their sort of workstation uh if if one can call it that they usually uh you know set up put, put out their little little mat and then they kind of uh have their suitcase inside which is usually their typewriter and then there's another suitcase which has a lot of paper and stationery and things of that kind and then they kind of sit and wait for customers uh, you know there's also a tremendous amount of waiting you know in 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 the life of these job typists uh, so there's a lot of uh, camaraderie that you kind of see there's a lot of uh, you know uh, chit chatting joking a lot of tea drinking that happens especially in amdabad i saw a lot of tea drinking uh, sweet tea Uh, being drunk this this guy was interesting so this guy this bhagwan das at one point he used to be a sort of president of you know there's an informal sort of an association of these typists so he he used to be the president and it's interesting he sits there under a tree and uh, like i saw him you know just uh, you know around lunch time he kind of pulled out uh, you know a handful of chickpeas and he kind of spread it out you know behind him and and pretty much like on cue you know about three or four squirrels kind of came down for their lunch as well if you, you know if i may uh, <clears throat> so that's that's the kind of waiting that i was saying so naresh naresh brambhat here who kind of is essentially a gujarati typist uh, you know I, this this guy was asking so why why do you all you know you keep sitting on the floor uh, don't don't you all have any kind of back problems and things like that and it was they, whoever i asked is they all would laugh and they would tell me you know if i think now we have got so used to it that i mean you know uh, if you if we had to kind of sit on chairs and stools and work on our typewriters maybe that that's what's going to start giving us back problems as opposed to sitting on the floor now uh, you know it was rare that we saw women typists uh in in these sort of spaces i mean i know women uh and and typewriters were a common uh, feature in in men, in most offices at one point but i mean amongst job typists it was a bit of a rare uh thing to see we we, we found one a few of them i mean you know on on the premises of the district court in nasik though i mean uh but you know there was an interesting thing that i came across i mean uh, you know the course company uh, which manufactured stationery and uh, carbon paper and things like that i mean i remember while you know this is a logo that i think uh, i associate really with my childhood uh, you know when when you know in schools i mean we kind of used carbon paper i mean you know things like that. it was it was something very fascinating for us to be using carbon paper the, you know the the blue and black ink stains that it would leave on our fingers uh i used to draw as a child and i remember drawing uh you know the the, the lady at the typewriter uh was something that i that i drew quite often uh so it it's so i remember when when i was making my notes <clears throat> at the beginning you know or rather before we started the project 
there were notes about the course company logo and uh, you know the lady and the typewriter <clears throat> and i remember trying to uh, find ways of how we could photograph uh, you know the a, a simple uh, and supposedly boring object like the carbon paper so i remember in in uh, so i used to work in this magazine called time out and i was speaking to my colleagues at one point and you know asking them uh so so where all do you all where all do you still see type uh, carbon papers and in a time out had a very young uh staff i mean uh, you know you uh, basically in their early 20s and things like that and i remember a lot of heads turned and said carbon paper what what's carbon paper you know i mean that kind of thing and it was it was it was like one of those little moments uh and i remember this particular uh, photograph uh, so i was at uh, i think in bombay uh, at dobi talao uh, be behind the metropolitan court and uh, one of the the typists there you know he had a file uh, with with the chorus uh, logo but i mean it was a different logo as you can see on the red patch there it's kind of transformed to to a to a lady on a laptop and i found that kind of very interesting uh, you know obviously you can also see you know the the fashion her fashions kind of changed her hairstyles changed i mean you know her, her skirts changed i mean all of that and i think it was sort of an interesting contrast uh, to to kind of talk about a transformation uh, you know because the whole idea of the project also was about how sorry about how a technology that at one point was you know considered to be a, a sign of modernity as the typewriter was at one point uh was suddenly looking at redundancy uh having been pushed out by another technology which now is seen as a sign of modernity which is the computer and the laptop now uh so you know as as we kept uh, photographing uh, you know the uh, what's it called uh, you know the the job typists i mean we were also uh, you know getting information about a lot of other things i mean and here i think what was interesting was the way the collaboration worked i mean you know so uh, normally when i'm working on a project you know it's it's usually just me who's who's researching work working on it asking things i mean you know trying to dig up information here i mean i had the resources of the godrej archives and which was phenomenal and godrej's huge network of uh, you know dealers and stuff whom the archives team was then tapping into to kind of chase down leads and stuff like that and we found a lot of uh, instances of typing typing school still around and you know uh, repair people uh, so like so, so a few of these typing institutes survive today uh, the numbers of students enrolling have obviously dipped dr drastically perhaps because speedy and error free typing or even shorthand is no longer a skill necessary in the work space uh, moreover in a changing india during these intervening years other professions have also gained popularity with the changing times this was uh, at the ymca in, in new delhi where you know a, a, a huge room that was once used uh, to teach typing uh, is now kind of used uh, for fashion designing classes and i think i mean you know it, it was also sort of uh, a, perhaps symbolic of you know career choices that women were now now making in in these times i mean so typing uh, was not necessarily the uh, you know or, or a stenographer's job uh, is no longer a, a job at all forget it being a job of choice i mean uh, this is a uh, you know, typing institute uh, at the islamia college of science and commerce uh, in srinagar uh, you know and it was interesting because uh, you know the what the thing on the board which has you know the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog which is which is uh, the standard uh, typing exercise the thing that you are made to type that again is in srinagar at the modern era stenographic institute uh,
know, so this, so sometimes, I mean, uh, you know, uh, you often wonder as to who is and why are people coming in and learning typing at a time when, you know, the typewriter itself is becoming redundant at the workspace. I mean, what's, what's the purpose? I mean, and, and this was uh, at the Stenographers Guild in, uh, in Chennai that I kind of encountered Mrs. Vatsala Krishnan, who was 50 when, when we photographed her. And, uh, you know, she kind of chose to learn typing at, at her age. She said, you know, her daughter had uh, finally finished a college. I mean, she had kind of started her own business. And uh, she said, you know, I thought, I mean, it would be, it would be handy to, uh, to help out my daughter in her work. And uh, so she, she, she had learned typing, you know, before she got married, but then she needed to kind of refresh her skills and, and she kind of had come back to, to the Typing Institute to kind of get, get her speed back and things of that kind. So we were also meeting people like, uh, like, like uh, Mrs. Vatsala Krishna. Uh, this is, you know, this, another of those really curious things that we kind of encountered. This is also at the Stenographer's Guild. So this is a statue, a tiny little statue of Sir Isaac Pittman. I don't know where else in the world is, does Isaac Pittman have a statue of himself, you know. Uh, so this this statue is is probably about a foot foot in height, uh, painted golden like most statues down south are, and it gets a garland, a fresh garland every morning. Uh, so Pittman is is the guy who uh, is the man who, uh, you know, uh, invented shorthand. Uh, so a lot of, uh, you'll see shorthand uh, guidebooks and things like that, uh, manuals, which are basically Pittman's, called the Pittman's Guide. <clears throat> that shorthand for those of, those of you who are of more recent vintage and do not know, uh, that's, that's at the Hamdard Institute in, in New Delhi. That's, that's uh, again, this was in, uh, in, in Surat, uh, one, of, one of the oldest typing institutes there called the Kambay Institute of Commerce, uh, run by uh, Mr. Yazdi and Mr. Mernosh Karanja, and that's their daughter, Maruk. Uh, <clears throat> so they also interestingly run uh, a Parsi theater troupe. Uh, That's in Bombay. Uh, that's the Abhayankars. Uh, so people from Bombay, you know, if you are, if you've been passing by uh, Girgaon, you may have chanced upon uh, the Abhayankars Typing Institute. Again, you know, you will see uh, in a lot of these places, I mean, or at least we saw when we were working there uh, on the project as to how, uh, you know, we, I never saw full, full classrooms. I mean, you know, so there would be the occasional typist students who would be coming in uh, to work. That's in, in Calcutta. Uh, again, interesting sort of uh, things that would probably be lost uh, once the technology, you know, these kind of manuals. I mean, I, I love the kind of drawing that you see, you know, which is, which is telling you about which fingers to use for what alphabets. Uh, that's, by the way, a Godrej typewriter. Another thing that was uh, very interesting, you know, was, was the kind of things that you came across uh, around you in these kind of, the kind of detailing, uh, like I, I used to kind of love these, uh, you know, the posters uh, on the, on the walls uh, of these typing institutes. Most of them had these vintage posters kind of framed and put up. What's interesting is also that, you know, the typing examinations still continue. And uh, that's, that's one of the Maharashtra State Board uh, typing exams for the year 2012 uh, that was happening in a school in Worli. And, and I remember, uh, you know, walking up and down, going from classroom to classroom, photographing uh you know photographing these uh these these exams in progress and you know as, as you're moving around you're hearing you know the the sound of the machine and you're kind of wondering why are we doing this project because 
the idea of doing the project is that we are saying that the typewriter is is dead or is 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 dying but it certainly doesn't seem to be be the case if you were at Worli that afternoon you know because it was like classrooms filled with 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 uh, typewriters and and men and women giving examinations but they were all getting uh, you know these were all part of the process of getting jobs because it seems uh, for for jobs it's for government jobs especially it's still uh, necessary to to furnish uh, your typing speed and not your speed on a computer keyboard but on a on a, on a typewriter keyboard uh, and you see this is what i mean i mean in india you know uh, the technology doesn't just die i mean you know it it kind of lingers in various uh, forms uh, there will be odd usages I remember while we were, I think we had just finished uh, the project and I think I saw a photograph in the newspaper of a similar typing exam or something like that where students were kind of, uh, you know, if I'm not mistaken, crossing tracks to go to their examination center, lugging their typewriters. I mean, uh, it, was, it was quite a, quite a photograph. So a lot of the typing institutes, I mean, which which have typewriters, for instance, Abhayankar supplied a lot of typewriters uh, to uh, to this particular uh, center in in Worli. These are all scenes from different classrooms. Uh, you see, I mean, who would imagine that the typewriter is dead? Uh, or is is dying if you were to see these scenes. These were shorthand exams which were happening simultaneously, meaning you're having to decode this the shorthand into. <clears throat> and some repairers and mechanics, obviously, too, are in business. I mean. Uh, this is at the Hindustan typewriters in Mumbai. You know, one of the interesting things that uh, would happen often was, you know, when we would talk, because uh, I, I would also be spending time with these people, and often in the course of conversation, I mean, over tea or, you know, sharing a meal, they would let out little bits of information uh, i remember these guys uh, this gentleman here kind of uh, the one at the back him kind of suddenly mentioning about you know somebody he he kind of recollected somebody who had a house that was inspired by a typewriter okay i mean i'll we'll we'll come to that photograph later but uh, but you see this is the sort of serendipitous thing that would often kind of happen. And uh, then I would make a frantic call to Vrunda uh, at, at the Godrej archives, who like me would kind of get equally excited. And then we would, a chase would begin, you know, a, a hunt would begin. Uh, in this case, you know, what was weird was this guy telling me that, oh, you know, I know somebody who had a house inspired by a typewriter. Now, obviously, in my head, a certain image is beginning to form about a house that looks like a typewriter. I don't now. There could could have been. Uh, it could well have been a case of Chinese whispers. Him telling me something, I imagining something. Uh, he didn't recall, for instance, right away as to where this person was. Uh, I asked him, "Do you have photographs?" But you know, in those days, the time when he was talking about. I mean, it wasn't the time when. You know, you shared images on WhatsApp, so you couldn't quickly show. So it was just in his head. I mean, the image was just in his head. Uh, I wasn't even sure if he had actually seen it, but he had just heard about it. Uh, so the chase had begun. I mean, you know, while we were photographing all these other things. Uh, so the typewriter, you know, I, again, I mean, you know, this is the sort of stuff that we would be finding often. Uh, marvelously interesting stuff. I mean, typewriter, I would often hear on an average has about 1800 parts any any typewriter uh, and that's that's the kind of thing tiny little springs uh, you know and and large parts as well uh, that's that's another typist uh, typewriter repair shop 
in in uh, in fort in the fort area in bombay called supreme typewriter uh, i i wonder if how many of these are still around you know now that i'm revisiting this after almost 5 years uh, that's again uh, this is another fascinating story uh, that's that's miss Ash, miss asha velankar uh, you know and she kind of also repaired typewriters but it was largely actually you know her her husband uh, who was was the repairer uh, and uh, it was interesting one day how his uh, you know the company where he used to work uh, the, his boss kind of approached him with an interesting proposal and the proposal was uh, the hand of his daughter in marriage so the marriage happened and asha and her husband uh, you know start start their own business and i remember asking uh, ms velankar as to why was their business called honesty typewriters and she said you know because my husband was a very honest man uh, and so they decided to kind of name name their business, business as honesty typewriters as you can see on the paper which is in the machine uh so she she would largely you know at one point be more like a peripheral uh presence uh because the home kind of also served as as the workshop and as the, the as the office so clients would come in so she would serve them tea she would serve them soft drink i mean all of that they would wait they needed to be entertained all of that she had to do house household chores in the middle of all that i mean she was also picking up uh little skills so you know she would she would dust parts she would kind of oil parts i mean she would scrub and clean parts and things like that story she also learned how to assemble uh, a machine uh now the business business is dead uh it's been a while uh but you know if you if you look around the house you will find remnants of the business uh you know for instance you will find little boxes you know like you see an orange box in the frame uh which which kind of held held the ribbon uh you know the boxes in with the ribbons were sold so she keeps a needle and thread in those i mean so a little uh, another box kind of holds would hold change uh you know things of that kind so there's always memories of the typewriter which kind of float around in her house <clears throat> that's uh, in shrinagar uh, this shop this place called marshal marshal typewriter one of the uh, you know one of the oldest uh, in 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 the city there even in the state uh, and been kind of in business from pre independence time since 1936 uh, so the the old gentleman there that's mohammed mohammed the hangar and those are his two sons at the back and that's his grandson in the front uh, so that's three generations now uh, it's again i mean a fascinating story how uh, mr angar senior uh, you know uh, had I, i was told by sons that he has a bit of a uh, what do you say uh, you know thing for machines i mean you know some people have this thing they they can touch any machine and you know they're able to repair it i mean you know things like that so he had a knack for for being able to repair things uh so much so that it seems even a, a hospital x-ray machine at once conked out and and they called they promptly called mr angar and he was the guy who landed up uh and and set it set it uh back in working condition so mr angar kind of uh you know got his uh his knack of of you know uh, repairing uh, mechanical objects because uh people people usually owned uh, you know owned own guns and i mean people would require people to service guns and uh, so that's how he started you know as 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 a as a, as a young as a young man and from there i mean you know moved on to typewriters and were one of the few or rather in the beginning one of the only people in, in the state who was actually looking up maintaining typewriters uh you know and uh, i mean the business is sort of thriving still uh, you know and it was interesting to see a third generation kind of uh, uh, stepping in i mean though though the son one of the, the sons kind of told me that you know i mean it it's not 
as good as it was when we stepped into the business. I mean, uh, things are things are a little difficult. <clears throat> Another very fascinating uh, discovery for us was the last manufacturer of the type. Uh, you know, was still was still in business, and and interestingly, the guy the company that was kind of manufacturing that was was in india the last manufacturers of of the type uh, were were sitting in alabad in uttar pradesh uh, it was a company called characters types private limited that that's the spelling it's not my 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 typing error uh, and it was a company owned by by a gentleman called naresh sagar uh, the the fascinating thing was they uh, they would manufacture types of almost i mean you you just had to kind of uh, you know name a language and they would probably be manufacturing types in that language this is in bangla uh, this is the bangla script Bang bengali uh, uh, fonts uh, manufactured for a party in bangladesh as you can see from uh, from the the form here <coughs> And what was interesting was, you know, a, a process that is uh, that involves such high precision, uh, you know, uh, and uh, such a technical kind of process uh, like type manufacturing uh, and font designing. Uh, so this is this is actually the way that it is done. These are acrylic sheets on which a larger version of of the font is engraved. So on one side is the uppercase and on the reverse is the lowercase uh, this is the alphabet v and those those deep those markings that you are seeing uh, etched onto the uh, acrylic sheet are markings that that uh, the the workers at the factory would would kind of be able to make sense of i mean it's a code for them uh, that's how that's how the uh, thing is done again you can see the uppercase q and a lowercase q being done here so from the the larger size, it would kind of be uh, be shrunk to the tiny size that finally goes on to become the type that is fixed on the machine. Uh, now what what is weird is you think like you know this would be a sort of you know steel and chrome kind of place uh, you know with doing such precision stuff. But the factory actually this is this is what the factory looks like. And I remember entering there and kind of being completely. Uh, shocked for a while because you know you saw all these machines greasy machines and wondering my god what what do they manufacture i mean you know this seems more like an automobile manufacturing parts machine or something didn't certainly didn't look like something that made tiny things like uh, typewriter typefaces uh, so that's that's the type as you can see it's in reverse uh, you know uh, because that's how the uh, you know the mirror image would kind of become a mirror image of it would become the 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 correct uh, alphabet that's a percentage sign that you can see here so every every type is is then uh, so once it is manufactured there is a, a quality control department which kind of then looks into each and every type uh, that's the quality control department uh this lady is looking at each of them <clears throat> so now uh moving on to the next part uh you know we we encountered lots of interesting people as we were like i was one of the things that i was telling you about is this man who had a house that looks like a typewriter i mean i'll come to him uh but one of the first people is uh mr rajesh palta uh and that's his son keshav uh this is in new delhi uh mr palta used to be a, a dealer of of godrej uh, typewriters and other other stuff uh and uh, you know at one point i mean as that business started to falter uh you know he uh, one day had a lady walk into his shop with a very curious uh, sort of query about a certain kind of typewriter and uh, said I need it to be painted I need a machine uh, and I need it to be painted in a certain certain color 
and uh, she said what what color would that be and she kind of she was carrying a piece of piece of string and she said in this string uh, in this particular color so mr palta anyway kind of got the job done and then he kind of happened to read about it in the papers that this lady was actually an artist who was uh, you know and and she had used the typewriter as part of an art art installation and i think somewhere i think little gears started moving in his head uh, his son at that point kind of had suggested to him that uh, you know since the the market for uh, you know people buying new machines is is on 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 the decline maybe there's there's a market here as they kind of saw with this lady who had walked in 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 vintage machines and i think that's how that's how it started so mr palta whose business anyway meant that a lot of machines would pass through his store uh started instead of uh you know discarding old machines he started holding on to old machines started becoming more discerning about what he wanted to keep and what he wanted to you know repair junk uh or whatever and uh, slowly a collection started to build so by the time i met him uh, i think mr palta had already about i think 75 machines and uh, he was already talking about uh, you know his dream of of having a typewriter museum uh i'm not sure if mr palta's museum uh, is uh, i mean at what stage his museum dream is uh, but i hope it comes comes through soon uh, so he would prob- he would kind of also be looking out uh, so i was talking about how else does he kind of procure uh, these machines and i think it was really me as as a collector of uh, not typewriters but of a lot of other things who was also curious to kind of meet another uh, within quotes crazy person you know who's who's kind of chasing odd objects i mean uh, so he would like like me also be trolling uh, you know online sites like olx and you know things of that kind i'm uh, you know looking out for deals uh, and he's even found stuff uh, on all of these sort of sites uh, a, a, a local uh, radhiwala once came up to him and told him about uh, you know statesman house in delhi which was uh, you know getting rid of a lot of old furniture and and stuff that this guy who had been called is radhiwala kind of knew that there were a few old machines there and he kind of uh, you know pointed mr palta in his direction and he kind of went there and something very curious happened he found a few machines that were of interest to him and one of those machines turned out to be uh, a machine that his wife who was an ex journalist had kind of used when she was working at the statesman uh, so i think uh, you know a serendipitous sort of finding uh, you know i think was happening even with a lot of other people just as it was happening with us as we were chasing typewriters and stories uh, these were uh, what my colleague siddharth bhatia like to call hobby typists uh that's that's simarpreet kaur uh, you know she used to be an editor of uh, an on in flight magazine called jetwing uh and she she kind of used to travel to banaras very often uh on holiday or just just for the heck of it and uh she told me about a typewriter that she had recently bought uh you know a small portable typewriter from chol bazar uh it was this little red baby uh and uh she had actually told me about this really funny story when on, on one of her trips she was going to she was flying to banaras and uh you know i think at the bombay airport uh you know like we have to put our uh, hand luggage through through the scanner she kind of put her typewriter through it and uh, you know suddenly like i mean it was a bit of a flutter because you know the machine was kind of moved moved aside and she was asked to come aside and explain what the contents were and it so happened that you know when she was asked to open the box uh, the locks got jammed you know uh, which which kind of created even more awkward situations 
because she kept telling the guards that there was a typewriter and not one of them could understand what a typewriter was. Then eventually, I think the locks kind of opened. And I think she, they saw this machine and there was like massive curiosity around the security people because they didn't see, they, 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 they didn't seem to have seen a typewriter before. And they were kind of, you know, touching the keys and kind of, uh, you know, uh, with, with, with great amusement. And I think she finally had to kind of tell them that, I mean, you know, this is a Purane Zamaneka laptop. And I think, you know, then I think much tension was eased and I think she was finally let let to go. Uh, so Simar kind of uh, would tell me that, you know, when I'm, when I'm working in office, I mean, you know, I'm kind of working on a, on my computer, but I mean, when I, when I would be doing a certain kind of writing, and this is something which a lot of, uh, you know, younger people, younger writers like her, uh, who seem to have developed a love for the machine, uh, though they never grew up with it to kind of have enough nostalgia about it, would tell me that how they would, if they wrote poetry, they would want to write it on a typewriter because poetry, it seems, came out of a typewriter and couldn't couldn't happen on a laptop. You know, so I think that was the sort of justifications that people were doing. Uh, so a certain kind of writing, uh, people would tell me if I'm if I'm writing you know, things for myself, then I usually do it on a typewriter. I mean, you know, so I think they were demarcating between professional, uh, you know, demands of a, of, of a writer from their personal kind of pursuits. Uh, that's that's uh, a young boy called Siddharth Soni. Uh, I think he's still young. Uh, Siddharth uh, was, was a student, uh, you know, and when, when I met him, and uh, he had a very funny story about how uh, a lot of you might remember that some years back, uh, you know, there was a massive uh, power uh, power failure of the northern grid, and the whole of northern India uh, was plunged in darkness. And uh, Siddharth kind of was telling me how the next day he was the only only uh, only student in his class who kind of managed to to submit his assignment because obviously everybody's laptop and computers died eventually uh, so siddharth uh, you know he he got interested in the typewriter his grandfather had a typewriter and i think their family was shifting shifting homes and uh, he was a child when he kind of suddenly saw this this typewriter being brought out of a certain room and kept aside to be given away to the gardener who had a daughter and his parents, uh, Siddharth's parents kind of felt that the daughter might have uh, better use of, of the typewriter because, you know, she was just about to step into the job market and things like that. Uh, Siddharth kind of suddenly remembered his grandfather who would kind of show him the typewriter and and he would just not let go of it. So the typewriter, you know, kind of stayed with Siddharth and on the flight, Siddharth and his parents and Siddharth is sitting there with the typewriter on the flight. And I think those were his earliest memories of, of the machine. And slowly he kind of got uh, more and more into, into typewriters, started figuring out how to uh, how to repair them? He kind of started learning how how to work, how how to type. Uh, you know, he started collecting a lot of uh, old manuals, started downloading them from the internet, uh, taking printouts and saving them. I mean, you know, uh, this particular typewriter that he had, I think he never. Uh, it's a vintage machine that he kind of had bought, but he couldn't find manuals. Uh, physical manuals uh, anywhere uh, or repair manuals. So he kind of managed to track it down online. So again, I mean, a certain kind of, uh, you know, if one can call uh, a kind of a mad pursuit uh, that the typewriter was, uh, was, was, you know, bring about in people. Uh, These are the kind of cranks who I like to call. That's, uh, sorry, uh, that's the Patel family. And that's their home in Aurangabad. That's the family that I was telling you all about, uh, you know, the house that looked like a typewriter. Uh, I remember meeting, uh, we went, uh, Brunda and me, we kind of landed up uh, in, in Aurangabad. You know, so again, interestingly, you know, they managed to, the, the archives team managed to track down 
through their contacts uh, with dealers and stuff in in the city uh, you know they managed to track down mr patel now my my problem and this is a peculiar photographer problem it did not concern anybody else which is how would you do this photograph because again i mean we had no uh, you know we had no photograph to go by to to even get a sense of what this thing looked like uh, so you landed up there uh with with a prayer in your in your heart that you could be that you would be able to pull off a photograph now when we landed up there you know uh he told us that it's it's the roof which is of that kind uh you know that the, the design is really on the roof and uh i remember panicking because which meant that i needed a vantage point okay and luckily for me the house next door uh was a little higher than mr patel's house and uh, they were generous enough to kind of let us let us in uh to to kind of photograph it so the story is that i mean mr patel uh you know had heard he was again a kind of uh, a repairer of typewriters and uh, they had just moved he and his family had just moved out of their family home uh, which was in the old parts of our in the old city of aurangabad to the outskirts we were the very newer city was was coming up and um, <clears throat> mr patel had heard the story about a certain gentleman in aurangabad who had named his his home after a particular scooter brand and uh, since then his business kind of just took off uh, so he wanted to uh, to have his his home uh really be like his calling card so he wanted people to be able to spot his home from a distance and they should know that okay this is the home of a guy who repairs typewriters that's that's really the germ of the idea the germ of the madness again if if one could call it that uh so obviously you know in a lot of these homes in this uh in this neighborhood had this sort of a sloping roof which kind of made it uh all the more conducive for an idea of of this kind so uh, while the place was being constructed uh, mr patel kept trying to instruct the masons about how he wanted these rectangular uh, things uh, which would kind which which were uh, you know the, the keys and things like that and and obviously the guys were kind of thinking you know this this man is completely loony i mean you know and then they just weren't able to do it or they were resistant to his ideas and things like that but i think i mean uh, he he i think was was too taken up by the idea and he finally decided that his son told her that he finally decided that okay i'm going to start designing these these things so he himself started making these rectangular blocks out of concrete and and that's how they were done so you can see the space bar at the bottom uh you know the uh, so it, it's still incomplete as you can see uh and and then i think they ran out of money uh for for a while uh so when we met them he was telling us that how you know over over the next few diwalis i mean they managed they they would kind of finish off uh making the rest of rest of the the typewriter so this part on the left where you see my cursor that's where the rest the remaining part of the machine would come uh so i remember sitting there in the house as we were chatting and and asking him uh, you know one thing why why haven't you painted it and and why haven't you put uh, why are the keys blank and there are no no alphabets painted on it and i think he had probably been thinking about this long enough for him to not miss a beat and come up with an answer like you know with a pat and he kind of said but what's the use i mean you would only get to see see the alphabets if you're flying over my house on an aeroplane you know so so those are his grandchildren they sometimes are up on the terrace flying kites uh that's mr barve uh, who has a uh, a record in the limka book of records and his re and his claim to fame is really that he can teach people typing uh you know without looking at the keyboard in less than 25 minutes uh and i think i mean the, as is with a lot of these record books i mean the limka guys they came to their came to the house and and uh, they tested him and things like that and uh, and i think he he taught 
the the person who they had got i think in less than 25 minutes so so that same again i mean we we found him you know through a very lucky sort of uh, so that's my that's one of my students actually who you see in the frame uh, she's the one who actually found him uh, in villa parle there was a little little kind of note that was tacked onto a tree if i'm not mistaken you know like these announcements you know for pan cards and things like that so there was a uh, announcement of that kind which was stacked to a tree which said you know typing typing course in 25 minutes uh i'm sure a lot of you remember this sort of uh, stuff you know when we would get these kind of messages uh, this is all pre smartphone days uh, this is a message that i remember uh, that i had received during janmashtami and uh, it sort of triggered uh, you know uh, certain memories in me you know from when i when i started my career as a photographer i was working at the sunday observer newspaper and uh, we would you know those were days when you would receive physical letters uh, you know letters to the editor and uh, i remember on on various occasions like say it could be gandhi jayanti or shivaji jayanti or independence day or or whatever uh, there would be letters that came in where uh, you know there would be like say on gandhi jayanti it would be a portrait of gandhi drawn you on on a typewriter using typewriter keys uh and i remember kind of seeing those and being kind of quite taken up by it uh, so i made some calls to my my old colleagues from from those days and no one could remember those those letters you know uh so i i was kind of wondering when was, was i dreaming about it but anyway uh you know it it kind of again became a little note in my notebook about things to chase and uh, this was the year i think uh, of of the world cup which india won with with dhoni's famous six uh, last sixer uh, and this was also a world cup that was being touted as uh, a world cup which we have to win for 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 sachin tendulkar and i remember coming back from work one day and the the, the passenger next to me was reading the newspaper dna the dna newspaper and the dna was running a campaign about this old sachin and world cup and all this and uh, the band on the top of each page had some little anecdotal thing or you know some uh, <clears throat> stuff like that and suddenly you know my eyes kind of caught a little thingy at the corner which seemed like a a drawing of sachin but done on a typewriter now you can imagine all bombay bombay people here i mean you know on a moving train a rattling train a newspaper with a tiny drawing uh you know and then when the train kind of stopped i remember kind of you know holding up my commuters co commuters newspaper a little bit and checking and it was actually a drawing of sachin that had been done on a on a on a typewriter and there was the mention of a name of a gentleman called chandrakant bhide that's mr chandrakant bhide and i remember messaging runda from the train think tomorrow in at office go and look at look up the dna newspaper so and so page this is the guy we need to chase down so as usual the the archives team managed to track down uh, chandrakant bide uh, chandrakant bide used to be a, a bank employee uh, and uh, you know in his free time and he was he very categorically told us that never when in office hours but during you know lunch breaks and things like that he would try out different uh, he would play around on his typewriter making little designs using uh, you know the typewriter alphabets and stuff like that and i think it slowly kind of from there grew uh, on to kind of big, you know him attempting more uh, difficult stuff like say doing portraits of of various uh, celebrated people uh you know like in this portrait here i mean you can see there's a bal thakre there's dilip kumar there's a lata mangeshkar there's gandhi and there's sachin tendulkar sachin tendulkar incidentally told me was very difficult till he figured that you could do his curly hair by using the at the rate sign uh but you know again i mean this is difficult because it requires a lot of uh, you know a lot of 
uh, pre-visualization, if you can imagine. I mean, uh, but you know, what was interesting, we, we kind of found uh, others like Mr. Bide, uh, not just in, in Bombay, but a few of them around, around the country. Uh, so for instance, I mean, uh, you know, if, if say there's a guy in, in Calcutta, he would probably be doing in that at that time. I'm saying he would probably be doing, say, Jyoti Basu, uh, or or say a Mamata Banerjee instead of say a Bal Thakre. Uh, he would probably be doing, uh, you know, uh, say Shomitra Chatterjee instead of say Dilip Kumar, or say Shorav Ganguly instead of, or and such and Sachin Tendulkar. Similarly, down south, I mean, you know, uh, so these were sort of uh, the kind of things which these people were doing. Uh, I was very interested, uh, you know, because I came to know of this gentleman in Calcutta, uh, uh, a gentleman called Deb Kumar Biswas. Uh, he, along with doing the kind of other stuff that I just mentioned, he was also doing something uh, very, very fascinating. Uh, some of you might be aware of if there are Bengalis in, in the, amongst the speakers, that, uh, you know, Abol Tabol or uh, what is basically Shukumar Rai or Chodujit Rai's father, Shukumar Rai's uh, nonsense rhymes, you know, which is a bit of a Bengali, uh, you know, every, every Bengali worth of salt would probably know Abol Tabol. Uh, so this guy and these illustrations of Abul Tabul are kind of also very famous. I mean, they're as famous as as the nonsense rhymes. So Dev Kumar Biswas had uh, had created these each of these illustrations uh, using a typewriter. That is uh, the one on the right. The one on the left is is the cover of his book. Uh, so th and then he kind of printed out these uh, a handful of these books, which is essentially a replica. Uh, of the original design of Abul Tabul, and he's just swapped the original drawings with his own uh, own drawings here. So that is uh, Hunkomuko Hangla, the one on the top that you're seeing. That's the character, uh, and that is, I think, Tash Guru on the right, or Ram Chagolir Guru, something like that. Uh, the, you know, this this is also one of I think my you know if if there has been a regret on this project, it has been this particular thing that uh, that I couldn't get, uh, that I couldn't convince Mr. Biswas to be a part of the project. Uh, I, I remember kind of going to Calcutta twice, or was it thrice, meeting him thrice in Calcutta, trying to convince him as to, you know, why he should be part of the project and things like that. But I think, uh, I think uh, maybe I wasn't convincing enough, or maybe he just wasn't seeing the wisdom in what I was saying, uh, but anyway, so I, I I got a couple of copies of his book. These are not part of of our book uh, because we didn't have permission. But I'm just showing these to you uh, at this talk. Uh, this is some of the diehard, uh, pretty much nearing the end of the talk. Uh, you know, this is a this is a Parsi homeopathy homeopathic uh, clinic, a pharmacy at Dhobitalao in Bombay. Uh, and again, you know, it, it's again one of those sort of lucky things, you know, how I think uh, me and I think all the people who were involved with the project were always keeping their eyes open uh, for typewriters. Or I guess, I mean, even if we weren't keeping our eyes open, the typewriter would just materialize in front of our eyes. This was in Dhobi Talab, and I remember passing by just opposite the Parsi Dairy Farm. Uh, is is this particular shop called the Parsi Homeopathic Pharmacy? Uh, they, I remember, moved, you know, zipping by in a in a in a in a in a taxi and and chancing and suddenly noticing something that was a typewriter or I thought it was, uh, and it turned out to be a typewriter. Finally, when we went and met them, uh, it was curious as to why they continue to use the typewriter. They basically continue to use the machine uh, only because of they use it to type the labels that you see on the bottles on the right. Uh, so said, but why can't you write it by hand? And she said, you know, sometimes the liquid drips and it kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the ink smudges and things like that. So I guess, I mean, people had odd justifications and, you know, so the machine, uh, machine just kept lingering on in use. <clears throat> uh, 
that's the final story for the day. That's Mr. Bhandari. Uh, this again, I, uh, you know, uh, because I was talking so much about typewriters to anybody and everybody that I met, uh, my gallerist uh, in, in Calcutta, uh, you know, she kind of happened to mention, she suddenly remembered one of her clients and friend, uh, you know, the Bhandaris, who had actually bought a painting uh, of uh, a typist Babu, as they are called in Kolkata. And uh, so she kind of put me in touch with them. I landed up in Delhi, met them. Uh, and <clears throat> so the Bhandaris originally spent the early part of their lives in, in Calcutta, a lot of their working lives in Calcutta. Uh, I think Mr. and Mrs. Bhandari even met each other in Calcutta. They, they dated while in Calcutta. Uh, Mr. Bhandari started his first job in Calcutta and he kind of said very often as he would be moving around the Dalhousie area, he would see the job typists, you know. And for him, the memory of his beloved city was really to do with the typist. He said, you know, I can get photographs of the Victoria Memorial, the Howrah Bridge and whatever from wherever. You know, those are easy things to get, but where would I find my job typist? You know, so that's his lingering memory of uh, of his city. I mean, you know, and I think, I mean, the typists probably made up made up our cities in ways, and I think they're now disappearing. So I think along with them, a certain slice of our city, as a lot of us would have grown up to know, would be gone. Uh, so I will end here, uh, and we'll take any questions that you might have. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Chirodeep, for thank taking you. us through your journey of documenting these typewriters. Um, and for Godrej Archive team, it was like reliving this excitement of making the book. So thank you for that too. Uh, so before we start our Q&A, I would like to inform uh, our audience that they can share their feedback uh, on this lecture and there is a feedback form in the chat box here soon. I think it will come. Um, so, so actually, uh, Dr. Feroza Godrej has a question for you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Chirandeep, what, uh, it's nothing to do with the typewriter book. It's to right. do with your photography. At right. what age did you really, uh, you know, think of becoming a photographer? That's the first question. Right. And what was uh, your first camera? Uh, you know, I I I became a photographer really. I mean, it's 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 kind of quite by chance. Uh, you know, a lot of us would remember, uh, you know, the pavement bookshop sellers around Flora Fountain. You know, leading up to Eros Cinema and you know outside the CTO office. Uh, I I used to stay in Chembur in the suburbs and come into South Bombay very often. Uh, and basically also move around those, those, those footpaths trying to hunt, uh, hunt for bargains, hunt for old, old books and magazines. I was very interested in magazine design from a very early age. And I remember coming across a magazine called Life, uh, which a lot of you all might be knowing of, but I mean, I didn't know of it, of it then. I had never seen the magazine. I didn't know of it. And I picked up this copy of Life magazine. Uh, it was this large magazine with this uh, black and white photograph on the cover of this girl lighting a candle. Uh, you know, one of those protest march sort of things. And uh, I remember sitting on the pavement, kneeling down, going through it, and getting completely mesmerized with what I was seeing. You know, those large double spread photographs. This was the time when uh, a lot of interesting things were happening in the world. You know, communism was coming down. The Berlin Wall was to kind of... Uh, we pulled down in a few months, uh, all of that, uh, you know, uh, the Soviet Union was breaking, there was a civil war in Romania. I remember that particular issue had photographs of Nikolai Ceausescu's palace up in flames, you know, and civil war on the streets of, of Romania. And I'd never seen anything like that. I mean, you know, I was used to seeing a certain kind of very tame photographs in, in, in the times of India till then, you know. I'd never seen any kind of photographs like that. And I remember it just drawing me in. And that issue, I got it home. And I think on the bus ride home and over the next few weeks, as I just kept going over and over that same issue, I think 
a certain interest in photography started. Uh, and I think at that point, obviously, I wasn't thinking photojournalism. I mean, I didn't know what photojournalism was and all that. But I think repeat visits to Flora Fountain and I started finding a lot more issues of Life magazine. And I think my education in photography and photojournalism also began really from those footpaths of Flora Fountain. You know, so... I mean, it, it's it's kind of sad to kind of think today that, you know, when those uh, pavement bookshops are gone, uh, how much of inspiration is also gone in this city. Uh, so I think that's how my, was was really the, the trigger for me becoming a photographer. And my first camera, you know, I don't remember the, the, the model really, but I think it was a camera, a point and shoot camera that my father had, had, had bought. My father had been sent to Hong Kong uh, on work. That's the only time that he had traveled abroad then. And he had bought a point and shoot camera. You know, I mean, it was the sort of thing which I think middle class people did when they went abroad. They would buy things like a camera. And I think buying a camera in those days was, you know, was, was a huge deal. I mean, you know, unlike today, right? I mean, where every young photographer seems to be armed with, with very sophisticated uh, things. and. Uh, I remember that kind of being the first camera at home. And when I got interested in photography, that's the camera that I would kind of smuggle out uh, to go out and shoot because, uh, you know, the cameras at home in those days were really meant for special occasions, not for, for, a, for a teenager's indulgence, you know what I mean? So, so I had to really smuggle it out. Uh, uh, I think it was a Minolta, but I don't remember the model. So. I just asked my last question. Sure. Do you prefer sure. black and white or color? Uh, well, you know, in the early days of my career, I mean, I think I was preferring black and white. Uh, there was a lot of reasons for it. One was, you know, it's also something which is very common uh, with a lot of people starting out in photography, which is, uh, I think people, uh, there is this sort of notion you know, that black and white, people would say very, uh, very often, oh, you know, but black and white is so much better than color, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I also thought that way at the early stages of my career. What was also interesting was newspaper offices in those days had dark rooms. So when you shot, you could go into the dark room and, you know, make your own prints. I mean, I learned how to make my own prints in the office. And I think there was a, there was a different kind of thrill to see your own work come alive. Uh, so I think in those days, I was uh, veering more towards black and white. Uh, also, I think color, because we were shooting, you know, what was slight, was a little more difficult, was a little more difficult thing to do. And I didn't have, in those early days, at least didn't have the, the adequate skills to, technical skills to be able to work with, with transparencies. Uh, I think in, in subsequent jobs, I think I, I, my skill set kind of improved. And so today, you know, I think I, um, uh, I, I, I think I, I kind of like working with both and I kind of use them depending on the kind of projects that I'm doing. If you remember commuters, which you were there for at the Prince of Wales Museum, that was done in black and white. The typewriter project is in color. There's a lot of, I was talking about abandoned helmets, that's in color, <laughs> by the way, you know. So, uh, so I think it depends what kind of work, what the idea is, yeah. Thank you, over to you, Brinda. Yeah. Uh, there is another question by Shweta Jadhav, and she wants to know, and she's curious to know that how this entire romantic fascination of yours <laughs> for typewriters began. Uh, interesting story. Right. Uh, well, you know, uh, this is something that I have kind of uh, often asked myself and I kind of, I think I came, I arrived at this thing much later uh, when I realized that, uh, you know, when I look at a lot of my, my work, uh, that there is a, a, a sort of a tendency to, uh, there's, you know, I, I seem to be, uh, you know, be drawn to ideas that revolve around technology. And uh, when I say technology, I don't mean, you know, the, the science part of technology. It's really the, the social aspects of technology. Like when I think of, say, a project like, say, uh, you know, Bombay's public clocks, 
it's not really about clocks it's really about about the city i mean you know uh, when i look at an idea like say a one rupee entrepreneur uh, it's not really about pay phones but it's about the idea of enterprise and that peculiar trait of of bombay wallas uh, you know so so i think the the origins of the typewriter idea also i think i think deep down is somewhere over there my my interest in technology and and how it kind of shapes people and society and how people people use technology and you know uh, all of that uh, so i think and obviously i think the trigger was really you know when i when i saw uh, your uh, thing saying you know you're going to shirwal over the weekend you know and asking you what what's what shirwal and you say and you said that they're kind of going to stop you know the last day of typewriter manufacturing so i think that's that's really uh, that was the trigger really uh but i think i mean you know as as a documentary photographer one is also always on the lookout for uh you know these these tiny little news items which can then you know suddenly be expanded onto you know bigger ideas and you know things like that so i think that's really how it came to be so there is another question but it's more like uh, did godrej ever make electric typewriter so i'll just quickly answer that Uh, so we did manufacture the godrej did manufacture electric typewriters in 80 then then also electronic ones uh, but when the computers came with the advent of the computers i think that was shut down but manual typewriters uh, like carried on till 2009 uh, so that is another one and i think rajesh palta is here uh, whom okay. you mentioned <laughs> and he has a very interesting um, question and he says that most of the time when he is selling the uh, typewriters 90% of the people refer to the typewriter as godrej prima uh, okay. so did you ever come across that and you uh you know in it uh, it really depends like you know it for instance you know the thing that we we kind of saw right i mean say when we were traveling uh, in the east you know there was i think more of remington typewriters that were being used but i think more in the west we were kind of hearing people i think use the term as a more generic thing and saying godrej you know uh down south uh i think we were seeing more people use facet you know so so i think uh, there were the occasional i don't think uh it's like it it certainly wasn't like people saying mujhe ek cadbury dena you know it certainly wasn't wasn't uh, hadn't become a generic thing like that uh you know but but we did but i remember a couple of occasions when people said but i think these were largely in in the in the western side of of the country where i think there were more uh prevalence of godrej typewriters i mean you can correct me if i'm wrong runda uh yeah so i think means uh, it was very region specific many a times so what they would prefer and there is actually another question which is connected to the thing that you yes. just said about you mentioned about facet um yes. so there is anjali jain who wants to know uh, did you find people using typewriters of indian make or western ones and which were the interesting brands that you came across well you know these were uh, these were largely the brands i don't think we came across any odd brands that really stood out you know uh, uh i mean i think these were these were some of the uh, you know the recurring brands honestly i mean i think the remingtons the facets godrej uh am i forgetting any i mean uh, but there there wasn't you know it wasn't like i remember mr palta kind of showing me a typewriter which was i think mercedes mercedes benz uh i mean it, it's not that you suddenly saw you know one stray mercedes manufactured typewriter on the streets of say calcutta or wherever it wasn't like that at all i think they were more or less uniform uh, more or less uniform you know uh, yeah yeah i think and actually the brother the portable one was quite uh, popular with a uh, lot of journalists then because it was easy mm. to carry portable, and it was that's right. pretty lightweight mm. um, mm. so yeah um, there are actually a lot of uh, compliments that are coming your way and there is one <laughs> which i would like to mention because um uh, rutuja kade mentioned that her parents owned a typing class in vile parle oh. which we had known this when we were doing the book <laughs> and the class was unfortunately shut down so she had just commented and she mm. really 
uh, got inspired after listening mm-hmm. to you. Uh, there is another uh, by Arunesh Varde, and he is asking means uh, what year it was when you went to character type in Allahabad. That's I think you. What year remember. would it be? Two thousand eleven. Must be, must be around that. Yeah, it, and, well, uh, I think yeah, whatever. I think uh, must be two thousand twelve. Yeah. I forget. Yeah. but around and, that time yeah and he has another question where he says that uh, what is the one thing that you would take away from this whole journey of documenting type right <clears throat> oh that's a difficult one uh, you know one of the things that i would really have liked to take away is a lot of things that i was finding there i mean you know as as physically wanting to kind of i wanted to hold on to a lot of things that we would see uh you know uh i'm just joking uh, but i mean you know this this that's me as a collector really talking uh you know like i remember kind of wanting uh you know the the acrylic sheet that i showed uh which was part of how the fonts some the types are made I, i mean i i these are things that would have really been like takeaways for me you know if i could hold on to more more tactile memories of it um but i think you know there are lots of uh, things i think one of the most fascinating i mean this is the kind of fascinating uh, and i think this is really me talking as a collector again you know uh, because i think to be a collector means that you need to have a certain uh, you know a certain craziness a certain madness about you know about how you go about things and i think what i found with a lot of people uh, you know uh who were uh you know like for instance say mr palta or like say the guy whose house looks you know inspired by the typewriter or you know there's this gentleman who uh you know did the whole abul tabul on a typewriter i mean i think these are these are wonderful uh people to kind of uh come across you know i mean uh in in one's journey of of obsession you know so i think there was a shared obsession with uh, you know with with trying to while being on a project like this trying to document history you know so i think that's really the take away yeah uh, thank you shirodeep there are a lot of other compliments that are coming your way again <laughs> so paul matthew who has spent 21 years at godrej prima uh, so he has also congratulated you and he interestingly had uh, you know created one hour play on typewriter tales which is about the typewriter salesman so uh, yeah it would have been really interesting uh, and jyoti also has uh, really loved the session and she especially loved the whole story weaving that you did and uh, her mom was also a typist and she was very proudly she used to uh really you know to someone that he, she had also worked with godrej and oh, okay so, so okay. it's a lovely session and people have actually started parallelly discussing about the other brands so <laughs> it's really nice that you know your talk has triggered the conversation <laughs> so they are talking about oliveti hermes uh, baby hermes and right so it's it's really lovely to have you um Thank you. so i think there are no more <coughs> questions uh and uh, yes we would be actually putting this talk also on the youtube because there is one uh, question about that um so so yeah um so i think we uh, you know i would really like to thank uh, everyone here and please uh, share your feedback uh, the feedback form link has been posted in the chat box Uh, so thank you once again chirodi for sharing thank you pleasure the fascinating visuals and enthralling tales and i would also like to thank dr mukherjee the director general of the museum the board of trustees and the entire staff of the museum for supporting us as always uh, we would like to thank the museum society of mumbai the executive committee and the chairperson dr firoza godrej who always keeps guiding and inspiring even the team at godrej archives and uh, special thanks to jason uh, and the wonderful technical team they were the ones who were coordinating for the event and natasha and sanjana for managing all the technical support that we needed for this zoom talk and uh, finally thank you audience without you this wouldn't have been possible and also for making this q and a a delightful conversation so please keep following our social media handles of both csmvs and godrej archives uh, to keep yourself updated about our forthcoming events 
Um, so thank you and see you everyone at uh, in our future events as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Over to you, Jason. Thank you so much, Brinda, ma'am. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the forthcoming events uh, are as such. We have an event on the first, uh, followed by the third and the sixth, as they were mentioned by Dr. Godrich. Uh, thank you so much for joining in. And uh, Dr. Piroza Godrich, can we close the session for the day? Yes, certainly, definitely. Thank you, everyone. Thank We've you. had people from the US and all over. Uh, Srinagar and everywhere. So quite Wonderful. an interesting mm -hmm. evening altogether. And yes. Chirodi, thank you so very, thank you very, very much. much. Thank it you brought very much. the whole story back alive to some of us and to some of us who are joining for the first time. I think everyone's had a very pleasant and interesting evening. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Brinda. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Chirodi. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, technical team, kindly come in. That's her save. Oh. Video recording has.